Welcome. My name is Sarah Charters and I am the president of the United Church of Canada Foundation and we are so pleased that you've been able to make time to join this discussion tonight. Um, so what what I would like to share with you tonight is that uh, something I'm sure you're well aware of is that working towards reconciliation and the end of systemic racism is a crucial part of our life and work in the church and the foundation in our communities and in our lives. And so with that in mind, I want to recognize that I live and work on lands that are part of the um, Williams Treaties in 1923. Lands that are the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabewaki, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And as we'll be discussing tonight, reconciliation is about more than words. Saying a land acknowledgement is important and uh, equally as important is what we do with the knowledge that the treaties we talk about did not end up creating a mutually beneficial relationship. And so as I learn about the Williams Treaties, I am sharing that knowledge with my family and my community so that through the understanding of the past and now our current context, we can um, have a greater understanding of what we can do to help rebuild relationships. And so I invite you as you think about where you are located this evening, what are you gonna do with the knowledge that the land acknowledgement that you are familiar with brings to you? I wanna to share too that um, the United Church of Canada Foundation is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And it's an occasion that has offered us an opportunity to reflect on the past and look toward the future to determine how best we can support our church. And we've named four themes as part of our priority, priorities going forward. Anti-racism, reconciliation, and indigenous justice are two um, as our communities of faith and care for creation. And so we're embedding these priorities in all we do from how we make grants to how we manage our investments to how we work together as a staff and a board and how we communicate and are in relationship um, with the church in all its forms. And we are not alone in this. Many communities of faith share these values and our colleagues at the General Council share these values. And we all want to work together to build a better world. And so I'm pleased to have here with us tonight a number of folk who are going to offer their perspectives on actions various faith communities have undertaken to work toward reconciliation and to dismantle racism. Um, I'm very pleased to have Royal Orr, one of our foundation board members and the chair of the Joint Grants Committee, who's going to um, facilitate the discussion with us. Uh, the Reverend Anne Hines, who's the minister at Roncesdales United Church in Toronto, um, is here to share what their uh, congregation has done. Um, Mary Smiley, based in Saskatchewan and is a leader of the Treaty Land Sharing Network. It works with landowners and indigenous communities um, to support access and use of traditional lands. It's here as well. Um, and we're hoping that Paul Walfall will be able to join us um, uh, to talk about a, a project that he helped to lead in the former Alberta and Northwest Conference. Um, so I wanna thank all of our speakers for being here and, and sharing your stories. And as we get going, I'd like to introduce another very special guest, Adele Halliday, the anti-racism and equity lead for the United Church of Canada. Adele, I'm grateful you can join us and I'm gonna turn the mic over to you uh, to share with us a bit about why the church is engaged in the work and, and how you're helping us walk this path together. Great, thank you, Sarah. And good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. So just a few words of context to continue to build on what Sarah has already shared. So in the year, some of us may know already that in the year um, 2020, in October of that year, the United Church of Canada made a commitment to becoming an anti-racist denomination. This was a commitment for the whole church and its varied ministries across the land. And then in March 2021, the United Church Foundation also made a commitment to becoming an anti-racist denomination. And these were all important words. So why those words? Why those pronouncements at that time? Racism in the church was not new a few years ago, and the United Church has been working on various aspects of anti-racism work since the 1960s and beyond. And the church's anti-racism policy goes back 20 years. Um, 
we talk a little, a little bit about this in a document that was called uh, Working Towards Becoming an Anti-Racist Denomination. And it says, the United Church has a long history of condemning racism. And so for decades, the United Church has condemned all forms of racism, named racism as a sin, and worked to eliminate systemic racism. And people in the United Church have developed anti-racism policies and education programs, worked towards reconciliation and indigenous justice, adopted the calls to the church and created intercultural policies and initiatives. And yet, in spite of this steadfast and faithful work by committed people over generations, the reality of racism in the church is ever present. And so this is why the commitment uh, to re-engage the work, to re-engage um, and to do this in the long term, is a commitment recognizing that lots of great work has been done and there's still more to be done to continue to dismantle systemic racism in the church. And this involves challenging racism in all of its forms. So there were words, important words, words of commitment, words of covenant, words of action. And we talk about this also um, in other ways. Um, in another place, we've said words are not enough. Uh, this is a moment. This was a moment. The commitments were a moment for the United Church to continue to wrestle with its white privilege, its role in uh, anti-Black racism within the church itself, and its role in the um, wider Canadian context. So how do we think about making anti-racism a denominational priority at all levels? So words, good words, strong words. Um, but words without action can be mm, meaningless or weak, perhaps. Um, Anti-racist activist Ibram uh, Kendi has written extensively about anti-racism. Some of you may know his book. Um, he's written several. Uh, one very popular one is called How to Be an Anti-Racist, and his newer one is called How to Raise an Anti-Racist. Um, and so he talks about how we can't be passively anti-racist. We need to be actively anti-racist. So it's the words and the actions. And I'm really excited because I think tonight we're going to hear uh, about more than words, but people and projects um, who are doing anti-racism work in their own local context, which it will be really great. So I'll just wrap up and share one brief way of taking action um, that we've been doing at the national level, but it's really for the church as a whole. And it's a development of the United Church's National Anti-Racism Action Plan. Uh, and this is a plan that names five key areas of work. Those areas are education, advocacy, theology, healing and accountability and governance. Um, and so much of our anti-racism work is now geared around those theme areas. So I'll just share just a couple of brief examples. One around education is the creation of the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. It's starting this Tuesday, and I'm very excited about it. Tuesday, October 11th is the launch of this year's program. Uh, it features daily written reflections, opportunities for learning, faith reflection, action. Um, it features uh, anti-racism books from the United Church Bookstore with a discount. People have an opportunity to engage in study groups and there'll be live events every Tuesday. This Tuesday, we're starting off with Desmond Cole, who's an anti-racist activist, who's um, um, great, very inspiring. <laughs> so the 40 Days of Engagement is one great way to engage in education, learning, advocacy. Um, a second area around theology is um, some work that I'm engaged with, with colleagues uh, with the Theological School Circle. So this is the leadership from our theological schools, including principals and professors, around goals related to theology. So how do we think about anti-racist theology in, in various ways and places and spaces? How do we continue and deepen the work that's already been done? Now, lastly, just say about advocacy, um, we're engaging with advocacy with the United Nations um, on anti-racism, both as a written report we've done in the past and also doing some work with the United Nations working group of experts on, um, on racism. So the anti-racism work takes various forms, the global advocacy at that level, um, the, the national work around working with theological schools, um, resources for congregations like the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, and many other forms and places and spaces. So I just offer those as an example um, as maybe to help spark imagination, ways to help get involved, and also um, to uh, kind of lay the groundwork for inspiration to hear from who we're about to hear. So there's lots of opportunities to engage locally, and I hope that you'll be inspired by both what you've heard and what we're about to hear from the rest of the panelists. So thank you for your time and your engagement. Thanks, Adele. Uh, as always, I deeply appreciate your leadership and work. 
Uh, and so now I'm very happy to uh, turn the microphone over to Royal Orr to carry us onward in our time. Thanks very much, Sarah, and uh, welcome everybody. Really a great pleasure to be with you this evening. And like Adele, I'm really looking forward to the conversations we're about to have with three people who are deeply involved in the work of anti-racism and reconciliation, right relationships uh, all around. Um, a great pleasure for me to, uh, to welcome Paul and Anne and Mary. We've asked each of them to speak for several minutes about the projects they're involved with. I imagine that's going to spark questions even from our panelists for one another, but we're also inviting you to send your questions to us using the chat function. And we're hoping we have some time to, uh, to, to work those into the conversation as well. So please send us your questions and observations as we listen to these, uh, these brief descriptions of these very interesting projects. And, uh, and let's just see where the conversation gets us. I'm going to ask Paul Walfall to, to start off. Um, Paul is, well, I'm pleased to say I sit on the board of the foundation with Paul and I've gotten to know him a little bit, but um, he's been an activist on this front for a long time now and uh, was responsible for launching what he called and others called awkward conversations in, uh, in, in Alberta. Paul, great to see you. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the awkward conversations initiative that you launched. Thank you, Royal. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, is everyone hearing me? It's fine, yeah. Okay, good. Um, in, I'm trying to remember, 2015, um, I was coming to the end of my term as president of the Alberta Northwest Conference. But something, hap two things happened in Alberta um, around that time. There was an incident in downtown Edmonton where um, I think the actor's name is Jesse Lipscomb, um, was um, the victim of several racial slurs that were hurled at him. And his response was that instead of turning away and saying nothing, or as you said, just allow things to slide, was to confront the issue and therefore to make the um, to make the situation awkward for the person who spoke rather than the person who was the recipient to feel awkward. <laughs> um, so the, um, in Alberta, I mean, and in Edmonton in particular, there was this movement of make it awkward. Um, that sparked a point within me that we cannot normalize um, racism even in the church. And that although we were not, we are polite, nice Canadian people, and we don't like to feel embarrassed or to embarrass anyone, we wanted, uh, the point was that we needed to confront the discussion. And although the discussion, the issue of racism, in particular anti-Black racism, may be an awkward conversation or an awkward experience to encounter, the fact is that if we're going to deal with racism, um, then we have to embrace the awkwardness and, and do what is necessary. The, so that gave birth to an awkward conversation. And I must um, say that the awkward conversation stands on the shoulders of the work that has already been done in the United Church for how many ages now, and in particular, the work of interculturalism. Um, the reality is that while for me in particular coming into the United Church, we were hearing a lot about intercultural work, especially from the General Council Office, um, there was a shade of the conversation about racism that I was not hearing. Um, and I was happy to discover that it was there um, so the, the, the awkward conversation simply was standing on, on, uh, on the shoulders of work already done. And so what we did was that we, we, we said, okay, let us have a, let's have this conversation in the church. Let us talk about anti-Black racism in particular um, and how it affects the work of the church. Um, and by talking and engaging in this awkward um, conversation um, to normalize the, the um, a movement of um, being anti-racist and to stand against um, racism um, in the church. So we, um, the conference held 
um, Alberta Northwest Conference agreed to the holding of this conference. Um, we got funding from the foundation, yeah. And <laughs> we invited every presbytery in our conference to send representatives, and we opened it up to the rest of the United Church of Canada. What we did also was that we dovetailed the, um, the meeting of the um, Black Clergy Network of the United Church of Canada into um, the awkward conversation experience. So the, there was the Black Clergy Network meeting and then persons, the Black Clergy were then invited to stay on for the conference. Our speaker, our main speaker was um, Professor Anthony Reddy from the um, Methodist Church in Britain, um, who has written extensively about the issues of racism um, as a Black person in a majority white culture and I thought that his, his perspective I think was necessary um, because it mirrors a little of what was happening of, of the Canadian reality. Um, we had around a, almost a hundred people present and there sparked um, some interesting conversations. Um, not conversations that were easy to have, not conversations that were easy to hear. Um, and we were able to, uh, to, to um, show up some misunderstandings uh, and, and help to, 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 to deepen the, 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 the awareness that was needed. Uh, the, the beauty of the awkward conversation to my mind as I remember it, was that Dr. Reddy was able to add the theological and biblical support to an understanding of being anti-racist. So it wasn't just um, going out and say I'm anti-racist, but to, to, to ground it in what it means to be a, um, a Christian and a church member. I think I've exceeded my seven minutes, so I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually you, had, you had quite a bit of time left, Paul, but we're gonna start <laughs> back to you, so we're gonna hear more from you. I really like that that image you gave us of the, the intent being to, mo to normalize anti-racism conversations and anti-racism practices. Like that sounds to me like a very powerful kind of framework to do this. And so I, I want to hear more, but yes, let's move on and hear from <laughs> our other two guests and we'll circle back and, and, and loop and loop back into some of the some of the some of the rich things that you said. Maybe we can go next to Toronto to Anne. Um, Anne Hines is uh, with Ronsis I'm going to get it wrong. Ronsis Vales, I think, is what it is. <laughs> United Church. And your really great Walls of Welcome project. Anne, please. Thank you so much. And I would have loved to hear Paul talk for any length of time. So I'm looking forward to hearing Paul again. So I'm sitting in our very echoey church sanctuary, as you can see, because this is really where our project began. One Sunday morning, a group of congregants who have an organization called the Indigenous Relations Group, which is designed to give us information about issues and events in the Indigenous community. They did a little service, which included some mentions about what United Church of Canada people are doing across the country for truth and reconciliation. And the next day I came and did what I often do on a Monday morning, which is that I sat here in these pews Listen to spirit and ask, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? What does love look like now for us at Roncesvalles United Church? Not a hundred years ago or 50 years ago, what does love look like now? And I was very struck by having heard the day before about two churches that actually gave some land back. And I thought how beautiful to give something back, to give something away that was precious. So I had this idea our spirit spoke to me is what I do usually say. And I thought we should give away our walls. And I didn't know what that meant, but I looked around and I thought, this is what's precious to us. Think how hard we all try to preserve our church buildings and our church sanctuaries where so much of our life together happens. So I called up a local indigenous artist named Philip Cote. And I said, will you come and do something at our church and philip said i don't like church and i said i don't like it a lot either sometimes but he agreed to come and give me 15 minutes and so that's how i need to take you there now so philip and i went and stood right about here <laughs> maybe not the best place to be having a discussion with somebody who doesn't love church right in front of our altar and our cross. 
And Philip did exactly what people do when they really don't want to talk to you. You know, they're being polite, they're giving you your 15 minutes and then they are out of there. And then as I prattled on about the ideas I had for giving away this church, these church walls, he suddenly stopped and he looked directly at me and he said, what did you just say? And I said, we will pay you the money and you can paint murals and you can paint anything you want and you can paint anywhere you want in our big church sanctuary. Why did I do this? I realized that what we really wanted was a truth and reconciliation project where we would be changed. And how do we need to be changed? Well, among the many things that truth and reconciliation has taught us, it is how closely we all hang on to control, how much we want to make the decisions, even when we begin to see the incredible harm that it does to other people. So what I thought about this project was, this needs to be about us feeling what it's like to give over agency, to give over control, to give over control of something that matters to us, to someone else. So Philip then said, so are you gonna look at the designs? I said, we're not gonna look at the designs. Okay, are you gonna approve anything at all? We're not gonna approve anything at all. And then he started looking around the church and then he said, okay, so, Our congregation entered into this time of waiting where Philip was working on designs and we had no idea what he was going to do. And people asked all of the right questions. They said, well, what if he just paints something across our stained glass windows? Or what if he paints something that we hate? This is where we worship and laugh and share and cry. What if he paints something that really disturbs us? And those were exactly the right things to ask because we over and over said to each other, and that's what control, giving up control feels like. It's scary. And for us, it's only a little piece of giving up control. Can you imagine if you did not get to control what language you spoke, where your kids went to school, if you had no control over the major issues of your life, we were just living into the feeling of giving up control over what this beautiful place that we love so much was going to look like. So that's what I'm going to show you now, because this is what Philip painted. It's on 30 foot walls and it's across three walls. I hope you can see it. It's an Ojibwe creation story. It's spectacularly beautiful. The colors are amazing. And if you could see the stained glass window, which shines so beautifully, of course, in the sunlight, you'd see beautiful echoed colors and the Beatitudes. Philip chose this place very, very intentionally. The Beatitudes say, we shall be healed, do everything with love. And in that context, Philip paints these amazing murals. So I'm standing back to try and give you the whole effect. Spectacular. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) They are indeed spectacular. We've been able to share them with school groups and seniors groups and so many different groups using the words to explain to them that Philip has given us. We were also very fortunate to get a grant from the foundation to have a film made about the making and the creation of these uh, murals. But it's not a technical film. It's not about how much paint did he use or how high did scaffolding go. It's about Philip's cosmology, because Philip says that this is part of the eighth fire. The eighth fire is a time in human life and existence when all of us will become one. So by painting an Ojibwe creation story in a church sanctuary, Philip feels that this is part of the eighth fire of entering into this new time of communication reconciliation and connection. Mm. I can honestly tell you that these murals have changed us, not just because so many people come to see them and want to hear the story behind them. They have changed us because they are placed very carefully, 
very intentionally in our beloved stained glass window area. And now they share the same pride of place. So that means that these indigenous sto sacred stories are in exactly the same place of prominence and authority as our sacred stories. And they have changed it. That has changed us and changed me as a minister because it's allowed us to lay down this very burdensome idea that Christianity got it right and nobody else holds any small spark of God's wisdom in the same way. No, all of our stories matter. All of our stories teach us. All of our stories change us. And all of our stories are to be entered into deeply and honored and cherished. So this mural lives here now. It's had so many celebrations around it. Philip has come to do ritual here. Our Truth and Reconciliation uh, second annual Red Shirt March happened all the way down Roncesvalles Avenue and ended up here in the church where we had Métis singers and dancers just last week. It has changed how we use this space, how we feel about this space. It is more beautiful than I can tell you. And we are so deeply, deeply grateful both to have felt a small piece of what it feels like to give over control and also to now be custodians of the story about that very thing. And this is just an amazing story and we're gonna be circling <laughs> back to you as well. Uh, but time for us to move on to a third project that we're very excited about at the foundation. I really can't tell you how at the Joint Grants Committee, how excited we got when this first came to us as a possibility just to see what was going on in Saskatchewan. And I'm gonna turn now to Mary to talk to us a little bit about the Treaty Land Sharing Network, Mary. Oh, well, I didn't know it was so, so great to receive. I know you've said that, but to say it so loudly again, Royal, that's very sweet. That's very kind of you. So hello, everybody. I'm coming to you from the border, actually, of Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan. Um, so I'm on the Treaty 4 side, and just a half mile up the road is Treaty 6. And we, for the first time, we have some signs going up to say that. So I am one of 10 women who are part of the coordinating committee. And um, I am a nurse by training and a farmer by marriage. I'd like by starting that I'm by acknowledging that we are part of the Nehewak and the Shinabe, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and Métis people's land here on Treaty 4. And uh, I would also just like to land with you the idea that the Treaty Land Sharing Network is actually a land acknowledgement in practice. It's the action of land acknowledgement. I've got one other idea that I really want to lead, land you with. I believe that the Treaty Land Sharing Network is helping to act our way into a new way of thinking instead of what we normally want to do was think a lot about how we're going to act. So this photo is from our public launch on July 15th, 2021, last summer, and was at our farm here at Bladworth. And it was the culmination of three years of work to um, get the network started. And it was just, of course, the beginning. Next slide, please. So who are we? We The network is made up of farmers, ranchers, and other people who hold title to rural property that are um, one to honor treaties by sharing our land. Uh, we want to provide safe space and access for indigenous people to practice their way of life on the lands that we farm. The idea started as an idea from Valerie Zink, who's now a coordinator, and Philip Brass of Picasis Cree Nation in 2018. And as many of you across Canada will remember that 2018 was the year that the farmer, uh, Gerald Stanley, was acquitted of killing Colton Bushy, the young 23, 22-year-old Indigenous fellow. Um, and if you were in Saskatchewan, you, when Gerald Stanley was acquitted, it was like you could hear a thunderclap of shock and disbelief, really but it also spurred um, a really ugly taste in everyone's mouth uh, for, the, for the racist uh, problem that we had, particularly in rural Saskatchewan. So uh, I think this is a crowd that's gonna understand that what we're trying to do is honor relationships of treaty as they were intended and, uh, and to find another way, a, a, a way of moving forward in Saskatchewan in rural Saskatchewan in particular in a good way. Next slide, please. 
So for those of you that aren't familiar with treaties and, you know, three or four years ago, I wasn't either. So that's just part of how systemic, which means that every system around us uh, is leading us to understand things the way that the people who designed the system want us to understand it. So by treaties, uh, the treaties that we're honoring here, the numbered treaties, uh, the relationships, they were the treaties we mean that relationships among, among nations and including non-human nations. And during the numbered treaty negotiations, indigenous nations agreed to share the land with settlers not seed or surrender it. So the idea being that farmers could farm and indigenous folks could continue to practice their indigenous ways of life. They were not intended to establish a static set of terms that would be fixed in time, but provide a, a framework that's dynamic, relational and contextual, and that could guide the interactions of treaty partners over time. Treaties, as legal and political frameworks intended to govern the coexistence of various communities in a shared space. To Indigenous people, treaties were regarded as land use frameworks, which generally involved the establishment of separate governments and jurisdictions in distinct spaces and dual governance and jurisdiction in shared spaces and matters of mutual concern. And what I've come to understand uh, by spending some time thinking about this and learning about this more, they were covenants between nations and the creator in the, by witness by the creator. And what that means then is that we are all treaty people as a result of these covenants. And just by way of additional context, the Constitution Act of 1982 gave protection of First Nations and treaty rights, which is what we're trying to practice here. Next slide, please. In Saskatchewan, treaty rights are increasingly difficult to exercise. Since 2007, the Saskatchewan government has sold nearly 2 million acres of crowned land that previously belonged to the people of this province. This land totaling the area twice the size of Prince Albert National Park, which tell, let me tell you, is a really big park. Okay. Indigenous people hold both inherent and treaty rights to move freely throughout these territories and to use and steward the plants and animals on these lands. And we need more activism and movements dedicated to reversing these trends, uh, supporting land rights and understanding treaties as frameworks for separate jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So how does this work in practice? So let's say you have land in Saskatchewan and you want to join the treaty land sharing network. So you'd go onto the website and say, I'm interested in sharing my land. And what you would do is that you would agree to four principles that both I'm gonna share my land as treaty intended. I'm going to also commit to understanding what my role is in helping to move forward in a good way, honoring and experiencing treaty as they were intended, a land sharing experience. Next slide, please. So then if I was an indigenous land user then, I could go onto the website and say access land and I would see oh my goodness there's all these locations in Saskatchewan. I would click on the box to say I'm an Indigenous land user and that I agree to follow the protocol and I'll say a little bit more about the protocol and then you'd submit that button. Next slide please. So land can be used for accessing for uh, for gathering plants, medicines, rocks, hunting and ceremony. And additional uses can be discussed with landholders, for example. Access to, by, to the land is, will be on foot. All gates must be left as they are found. Open fires are not permitted unless all parties involved are in agreement. Communication will be op open, respectful, and non-judgmental. And any potential conflicts, the, um, the facilitators and organizers of the Treaty Land Sharing Network will act as mediators. We've had no problems. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the early um, er, early sections of the, the the first farms that that showed up, and so then the the indigenous land user. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, the indigenous land user would say, "Okay, well, I'm close to Belgoni. I want to I want to see what's happening in in Belgoni." And so this Belgoni Edenwold property it has all these um, various things available and the contact information would be a phone number and the general RM or, or area where this is going to be found. And so they would phone that person and say, I'm interested in accessing your land. Um, what's a good time? Next slide, please. So here's where, oh, this slide's not going to show up. Okay, well, this is where I wanted to show you the beautiful signs that we got <laughs> uh, funded. You can go on to the next slide. 
uh, funded by the United Church of Canada uh, Foundation. Um, there is another copy of this, uh, the sign in a little bit later on. Sorry about that. Um, but then this year, uh, we had another hosted land sharing event. I just want to say a little bit about that. So we had to have the signs. The signs are critical because it does, it's just not safe for to have brown colored skin and show up on a farm. That, that's shocking to me, but uh, I am convinced by watching the Indigenous folks that I've been working with on this one, when they come to rural property, there is a lot of anxiety. So as I mentioned earlier, the Treeland Sharing Network was created as a counterpoint to the shooting death of Colton Bushy and the subsequent acquittal of the farmer that shot him, Gerald Stanley. And as a counterpart, what we wanted to say is not everybody in rural Saskatchewan holds the same views, but we want, we want to be in a, in a good relationship moving forward. So this last summer, with some additional funds from the foundation, we've been, a, we've been able to host land sharing events because for a lot of Indigenous folks, it's just not safe. It doesn't feel safe. Even though this land is posted, it just doesn't feel safe. So we organize the event and we have an Indigenous um, interpreter, knowledge keeper there and, and so on. So I'm, I'm just welcoming everybody to this event. And some I noticed that Colton Bushy's mother is in the group. And this is Mary giving tobacco to Colton Bushy's mother. And what I want to say uh, about all of this is that she was extremely anxious. She was she was brought to the event by by another settler person. Uh, she was she had had to have them pull over. She was so anxious when we moved on to a, a, a rural road, and then she couldn't believe that she was actually going onto a farm. She didn't think she'd ever be on a farm again. At the end of the day, after some interpreted land sharing and in some celebration together feast, she said in the sharing circle at the end of the day that she felt some healing, which was more than we ever thought possible. So that felt that felt pretty good. Next slide, please. So there's the sign. So these signs were the first uh, foundation, United Church of Canada foundation money that we were able to access and have made a huge difference to the ability of this little fledgling network to get to get off the ground. Um, the signs, I hope, someday will not be required anywhere, uh, because that would really be living out our, our shared living as treaty expected. But for now, these lovely signs uh, are posted here and there. And even though there has been a lot of um, attention paid to our farm, in our community, I'm sure all my neighbors are really familiar with the treaty. No, they're familiar with the fact that Mary and Ian are involved in the Treaty Land Sharing Network. But unfortunately, it's a little crickets out there yet. Uh, there's just not, I'm not sure why there's not enough uh, curiosity, but there isn't. So uh, just in closing, I want to say that in the first couple of years, we are now over 18,000 acres, which I know for lots of parts of Canada, that seems like an extraordinary number. But in Saskatchewan, that's still a really a drop in the bucket. And we're about between, I think we're near, closer to 40 members now. We have, um, we have, we don't have the Indigenous land use that we would like to have, again, because the whole attitudes and fears of uh, being on rural property but um, thanks to the United Church of Canada Foundation and the opportunity to start saying and and acting acting our, our way into a new way of thinking um, this is this has all been possible so thanks for the time to be able to tell you more about the Treaty Land Sharing Network and thanks for the foundation support. Thank you very much, Mary. I just want to mention in passing that the, uh, the the network's website is really beautiful. I mean, quite apart from its functionalities, which are great. I mean, just the, the pictures and the descriptions of the properties and the land, uh, really, really worth checking out. Okay, so thank you to all three of our guests and, to, and those be beautiful descriptions of the projects. There's all kinds of things. I was taking notes as you were talking that I thought were interesting, but We've got these three great people with us, so I want to circle back around and ask Paul and then and then uh, Anne and, and eventually Mary again what you were hearing that really stuck, uh, you know, struck you, uh, inspired you, made you say, I want to hear more about that, or made you say, gee, that's very cool. I'd like to see something like that happen in my home congregation or my community. Paul, if you're still with us, 
Um, what did you hear from those from those descriptions that you found significant or interesting? I think what I heard uh, that's most significant to me was a willingness to try something. Uh, there was a willingness to try something and to recognize that trying something is better than nothing at all. Um, different ways of approaching, um, for example, the issue of right relations and, and seeking to, um, to continue the path of reconciliation. So one, it is that try something. And second thing is, is process. Um, I don't think any of the three of us spoke of destination but simply process, it's, it, we're continuing on a process. Um, and as we seek to become anti-racist, we can't be saying, okay, oh, are we there yet? Uh, it's a question of constantly moving and doing that which is needed to be done to, 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 to try and recognizing that we may fail. We may not, what we, what we try may not come over um, the way we want it, but it's the willingness and the grace to learn and to continue trying. That, that, that's what speaks to me very strongly in what I've heard. Anne, I see you installed there beneath your beautiful mural. Um, what, what did you hear this evening so far that, that's, that struck you as, as, as important? Uh, Mary, I spent my first years as a minister in rural Saskatchewan, so I laughed when you said 18,000 may feel like a lot, but it's not. I get that completely. Um, I was really struck by the sense I got from when Mary was speaking about, we're here for the long haul. This is not something you start and it may take off immediately. It takes time for people's attitudes to change. We experience that here all the time. Um, Roncesvalles is a very busy church for many, many reasons, and a lot of people come and go here all the time. And uh, over and over and over, people say, I never expected to see something like this in a church. And that reminds me of how far we have to go in helping people see that church can be done in another way. So mm -hmm. I appreciate your tenacity, Mary. You're a, a true prairie woman. <laughs> well, well, it also reminds me too of Paul and how, you know, he emphasized the process of the conversation, yeah. one that sort of doesn't end, that keeps going. I mean, it's, 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 it is more the journey than the destination. The mm -hmm. destination is relatively clear, but, but it's, it's the journey. Mary, what, it, what, what were you hearing this evening that you thought was significant? Well, I too picked up on um, Paul's comment about normalizing. Uh, and I, in my past life, I got to be part of denormalizing tobacco here in Saskatchewan. And at that point, we knew there were five things you needed to do to denormalize tobacco. And so anybody who no longer has smoke-free public places, that denormalizes. So I'm, I'm really struck with that. Like, how do we denormalize racism? And I would offer this idea that if you can see habits of thinking habits of communicating and habits of decision-making that, that are embedded in all of this construct that we have about white being white, somebody else being something else. Mm -hmm. Those are habits of thinking, habits of communicating, and it gives me hope that we can figure out how to change those habits when they enter your head. That's the one that I like that. I also like the give over idea, uh, give over control. So usually when I introduce the Treaty Land Sharing Network, I say, you know, we thought sharing was hard in kindergarten. So this is, as the Treaty Land Sharing Network is exceptionally simple in its idea, and you only have to scratch it a little bit to get to the complexity and the mm -hmm. ugliness that's all underneath. Similarly, what, do, what are we afraid of by giving up? And just like kindergarten, you know, giving up the toy or giving up whatever, what causes fear in us? Because that's when the ugliness comes out. That's, and if we can tune into our fears, what is the othering doing to us? What do we, what do we risk losing? So those are all, it's a great, great group of ideas here you've put together. Well, I'd, I'd like to sort of pursue a couple of things. I mean, things that you've all spoken about in quite different ways, but still, uh, you're all working out of the context of uh, communities of faith, which are either a, a, a direct base for you or 
uh, or involved with you in some way. And I, I, I wondered if, if any of you had any ideas about how to build the kind of partnerships you've all talked about that have led you to a point where you could have the awkward conversation, where you could take the risk of giving away a wall, where you could keep yourself focused on, uh, on, on a challenge like land sharing. I mean, it, it sounds to me in all of these cases like partnerships were critical and key. Um, mm -hmm. Faith communities were part of those partnerships, but finding the partners and bringing everyone along sounds to me like a major challenge. So. Paul, Mary, Ann, anyone want to take a run at how to do that? Uh, that's such a good question because partnerships in the case of doing anything in truth and reconciliation are front and center, you know, nothing for us without us, right? Um, so not only did we partner with Philip Cote, but we reached out to other uh, Indigenous organizations in the area when it came time to have our opening kind of uh, event and were very much led by what they wanted to bring us. So again, it was we provide the space, we accommodate what they want, but they create what they think is appropriate for opening this space. Um, I will say that we have been fortunate uh, in Roncesvalles to have something of a history um, of reaching out to Indigenous groups for different projects. Small things, you know, we've all done the blanket ceremony in our churches, right? You know, we've all had Indigenous speakers. Um, going back to those people and explaining that we're taking it, that we're, we're offering more <laughs> has been very successful for us um, when we make it clear that we step back. Any other co comments that people have on that? challenge of partnering and the challenge of building partnerships. I'm looking at Mary and Paul here. Mary? Yeah, so I don't know that ours, I mean, certainly there was uh, partnerships in terms of uh, engagement with Indigenous folks to make sure that what we were putting on the table was actually um, something that was wanted and needed going forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other interesting thing that I find fascinating about the Treaty Land Sharing Network is that we don't require a relationship in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of settlers mm -hmm. who really want to share their land so that they can build friendships. And, and that's great. I, that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it shouldn't be a barrier to land access. Indigenous mm -hmm. folks shouldn't have to show up and be our friends in order to, because mm -hmm. the treaty treaties were, were clear that they were gonna share the land. What I, I just wanna say, it's, I think it's about courage. And the fascinating thing to me, when people say, oh, that must be so hard. Oh my goodness, it is so rewarding. It is so easy. So, you know, to have uh, an indigenous land user be on our land, and the example was this little slough on like the, the part of our pasture that we call, we hold for cull cows. That means the ones that are retiring. Um, so I would normally say this is land of very little interest or value to me as a farmer. Well, he and his mother and grandmother found between 30 and 40 plants of interest to either spiritually or medicinally or food wise. And you go, oh, my goodness, you just you you've taught me something about my land that I otherwise would never have learned just like back in kindergarten. Right. So it takes a little courage. But the alternative of doing nothing. We also have to acknowledge that because for as long as we don't act because we're scared, then we're holding the current systems of all of this in place and we are culpable. Paul, you have a comment about partnerships and how to partner effectively? I think um, one of the things for me in partnership is to recognize that we don't have to start at the same point. And all partner or participants in a partnership don't have to start at the same point. Um, and I say that to, to, to say that in stepping out, you have to also, in partnership, you have to be willing to hear the fears of the people who you're calling into partnership. Mm -hmm. The downright no's, never, not in this life or the next when people tell you that. The anxieties that people bring to bear with it. Um, and partnership means, um, helping them to come along with you um, in the process. Um, because for some, 
the, 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 the statement um, of um, being racist or, or seeking to be anti-racist, it, it's, it's a big bogeyman for some people. And so, you know, you have to be willing to hear people's anxiety and angst on that mm -hmm. in the process. Um, and uh, along with the question of people saying, um, do we really need it? Um, I still think people ask the question, do we still, do we need it? In the, in the United Church. Um, and it, it's not to be daunted by that. I, I, that's why I go back to the question of process. It, it will take time. It will, it, it's going to be a process. We're in this for the long run. Um, and at times, some uncharitable things may be said your way. <laughs> Find the support to, to work with it <laughs> mm. and, to, and to deal with it. Um, but we don't have to start at the same point. And, and, and there's something I just want to um, dovetail on what Mary said. There is a cost in doing nothing. There is a cost. Um, and sometimes we, 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 we think of cost in only the financial dollars and cents, but there is an economic cost in doing nothing. And sometimes I don't think we, we are willing to add up what those costs are for doing nothing. We've, we've got a question from somebody listening in, which I think is actually a great question, a challenging question, and probably a good place for us to kind of end our conversation here today. Both of you have talked or, or nodded and sometimes speak, spoken specifically about this, but the question is, what is it about our settler theology we, which makes it so difficult for us to challenge and to uncover the normalization of racism? All right. Anyone want to take that on? Because I'm going to get to all three of you in turn. But uh, and and you put your hand up, so you you take it on first. Um, we've been uh, very fortunate in our church, as I think many churches actually are, um, to have access to a lot of um, anti-racism workshops um, and materials, and we have uh, really spent a lot of time on this. And I think one of the things for my congregation that made the biggest difference when I, <laughs> the penny finally, oh my gosh, dropped for me. And I was able to stand up at the front on Sunday and say, I am racist and I'm misogynist and I'm a woman and I'm homophobic and I'm gay because how could I be otherwise? This is the world I grew up in. These are the rules I learned. These are the attitudes that I breathed in with the air. And I want to stop spending energy being so deeply ashamed about the fact that I have these attitudes and opinions in me and spend all of my energy working forward to live and learn and be different. I found that naming the fact that we can't be anything else having grown up in the world we grew up in took away for a lot of us the feeling of just debilitating shame understandable debilitating shame and it's not that we should not acknowledge that shame or that it's not real um, but I think for a lot of us we were able to by naming those things and naming why they occurred how could we be otherwise in the world we inhabit became a starting point um, to help us use our energy to do differently learn differently be differently Paul, Mary, would you like to take a shot at it next? Paul. I think we need to just take, um, you know, theological or look at the Bible, take away some of the value judgment that we um, add to it. You know, interestingly, I came out of general conference, general council this year, um, asking myself, why am I wrong? And then the question that my, that came to me, who told you you were wrong? Mm -hmm. Who told you that? Um, the issue is not being wrong or right, you know. The issue is accepting the reality of, of, of this is what it of what is. The colonial um, theology that was taught to all of us was to be com mm -hmm. to be compliant, complicit, um, compromise, um, not compromise, but complicit um, to to devalue um, that which is different. And it, it and I'm not saying that you're wrong if that is what you have been taught, or that Christianity is simply about just Jesus meek and mild. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I'm saying there's another part of the faith that we need to explore. Mm -hmm. 
a, a part that is radical, mm -hmm. a part that is that that that, that 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 challenges. So if we could put aside the the value judgment just a little, and nobody's saying anybody's right or wrong, but simply say there's another aspect of the faith that we need to explore for full and wholesome understanding of the faith, then I think possibly the settler understanding and what I call the colonial um, theology will be challenged. Mary. Strong caveat. I'm the least theological of the group here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think what I've come to understand is that the settler worldview in the pyramid has the creator God at the top, then humans, then animals, then plants, then, you know, the land. In the indigenous worldview, that one's upside down. And it is, it is the land, then it's, and creation, and it's the plants and animals. And then low life down here are the humans. And because we all, and this is a wonderful headspace to be in, it's, we all depend on the land. The land supports all of us, all of, all of our relations, plants, animals, rocks. And I think that take that theological lens to our current way of thinking and have those conversations uh, in new ways going forward, that would be, that would be, in, I think that'd be such an, ex, an exciting conversation to think if we upended our ideas about what's superior, what could we be better moving forward? Sounds theological to me, Mary. <laughs> just a nursey thing. <laughs> just a nursey thing. Well, or a farmer thing or something. A lot of time for nurses and farmers. Hey, listen, uh, we, we are coming to the end of our time. And so I want to offer my personal thanks to Paul and Anne and Mary. And I'm going to now hand this back to Sarah to, 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 thank, us all, to thank you all a little bit more. Um, a little bit more formally. Sarah. Thank you. This was such an amazing conversation and we are so blessed by the learnings and wisdom that you have shared tonight. Just really, really wonderful and very appreciative of your time. So thank you. And thank you to Royal for um, keeping us going, keeping us on time, which is hard with such a with such a rich conversation, um, uh, and to to facilitate the the questions and the discussion so so masterfully. So thank you. I also want to thank everybody who came tonight. I hope I hope uh, it was as um, heart touching for you as it was for me. Um, and I have I have two things to ask of you uh, in that context um, in relation to to this event this evening. And the first is to share it, to share what you've learned, what you've heard, what inspired you, what you're grappling with out of this conversation. Share it with your family, with your friends, with your community of faith. It's a really important aspect of the learning and and acting into uh, a new way of being. Um, we just can't keep it to ourselves. We need to we need to share and, and pass this knowledge along. Um, and the second thing I would ask is that you make a gift to support work like this and to help us all move forward um, and to to um, make I forget exactly how you said it, Paul, but it was wonderful. Make that awkward more normal, um, you know, and to help us all act into the way of being. So there, um, it's it's what we need to do, we need to do more of this kind of thing in order to make the change, change the status quo. So um, Jess is going to, or has put a link in the chat. Um, and as always, you can learn more and make a gift um, through the foundation's website at unitedchurchfoundation.ca. I would also encourage you uh, to be in touch if there are any questions you had. Um, you think of afterwards for the panelists. Uh, I know there's at least one uh, answer that I owe uh, somebody. So again, just thank you. Um, deep appreciation um, for our panelists and their wisdom and for all of you for making time and carrying this work forward. I wish you all a wonderful evening and hope to see you next time we do something like this. Thank you.